Good morning. I am Lou Jean Moyer, a member of the First United Methodist Church here in DeKalb. I'm glad to be here with you today. It is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and we will be continuing with our series on looking for love in all the wrong places. At First United Methodist Church, we are all about loving, connecting, and serving. One of the ways we can do this, especially uh, if those of you are the first time visitors, is to join our text text messaging system. Simply stated, you need to put in welcome to this number, 815-605-6688, and you will receive an update about once a week from our church. We have an amazing worship team this morning. Our pastor, Jonathan Crail, will lead us through the service and share his inspiring message. We have Cherie Durfee Smith with us, who is our liturgist. And most importantly, you will be here with us. Now let's take a deep breath Relax and breathe as we open ourselves up to God in his presence. Sometimes the things we think offer love actually seek to bind us, preventing us from being full and whole and offering our best love to the world. This season of Lent, we continue our look at our faith narratives that show us about true love. The story of Lazarus, whose funeral shrouds trail him out of the tomb, offer us a metaphor of new life as we recognize that true love is that which unbinds us, that wants for us more, not less, freedom and life. Jesus says to us, come out, walk, live, love, shed your funeral funeral clothes and offer your deepest self, your deepest love for the world. Of course, this kind of love can be dangerous, as we will see in the events of Holy Week, as the events of Holy Week loom closer. But the price of continuing to look for love in the wrong places is higher than the blessing of life lived boldly. Let us now join together in opening our hearts to the love of God. Before we even utter a word, we can be assured that God will offer us grace and a way forward. And for this reason, we can be honest with what pains us, what pains us most about our own thoughts and actions. So I invite you to join me in prayer. Holy and merciful one, in this season of discernment, we come bringing our deepest longings and our failed attempts at satisfying them. We have often looked for love for acceptance and security in the mirage of certainty, believing that if we just hold things very tightly, we will survive. We yearn for lives that matter. We desire relationships that thrive. We want less regret. At times, we fail to see that you have already given us what really matters, your love and acceptance. You provide opportunities all around us to make a difference in the lives of others. You give us a fresh start each day, inviting us to do better. In this moment of silence, we bring to you our pleas for openness to a different way of living. Take a moment of silent prayer and confession. My friends, be assured by the psalmist who says, In God there is steadfast love and the great power to redeem. And then let us respond together. We open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our vision to the ways of love created by God, embodied in Jesus, and already moving in us by the Spirit. We are forgiven, loved, and freed. Amen. Indeed, we are forgiven, loved, and freed. Amen.
Our first reading is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with the sovereign is great power to redeem. It is God who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. The second reading comes from John chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, and 45, 17 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, but rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, <clears throat> after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, 
his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Amen. We turn now to our message, and we are continuing our series, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. As humans, we tend to look for love in all the wrong places, and unfortunately, looking for love in all the wrong places results in mere fleeting pleasure or a shallow peace, leaving our hearts longing for something more. In this season of Lent, this is a great, wonderfully reflective time to reassess where we are searching for meaning and purpose. And we've been moving through stories of Jesus so that we might find the one who offers the real deal, love that truly satisfies our deepest yearnings of our souls. As we open up our heart to hear God's word for us this day, I invite you to pray with me. Let's invite God to speak to us. Let us pray. Holy God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, come at this time, wherever we are, to fill our hearts, to renew our desire to know you more. Speak into the depths of our souls that we, so that we might experience and know for ourselves your love, the love that truly satisfies and, and meets us where we are. So come, Lord Jesus, speak to us right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, this week I had the privilege of joining a learning mission trip for four days to the borderlands of southern Arizona in and around Nogales, Arizona and Nogales, Mexico. Unfortunately, like much in our divided politics, the border has long been a divisive hot-button issue. 
whether it's in the media or in the rhetoric of politicians, what happens then is we get a skewed perspective of what life is really like along the border and we become bound, we become tied up, bound by misperceptions. For example, we are told to fear the invasion of caravans of migrants or drug smuggling or human trafficking. And these are definitely real problems. They're not something we can hide from or, or shy away from. But they get so much coverage or publicity that, that the issue become really greatly exaggerated and they overwhelm all the amazing positive things happening in border communities the real life that happens there so again for example at the Nogales port of entry literally millions of dollars in produce and other goods cross back and forth between the United States and Mexico every day on this trip we saw train loads of products coming from Mexico, from maquiladoras, which are factories set up by U.S. companies that are staffed by Mexican workers. Everything from automobiles to electronics to other things. On the U.S. side of the border, we literally, literally saw block after block after block of cold storage warehouses for all the fruit and produce being shipped from Mexico to markets around the United States. On the Mexican side of the border, we saw huge housing developments set up to provide residences for all the factory workers. And we saw streets bustling with business and commerce. This is a far different image than the one we get from our news sources, which again, typically just focus on the negative things going on. So in addition to all the business and commerce that we saw and all the activity of people going about their daily lives, we also saw families with young children who were in shelters where they found an oasis of safety and, and care, a place of respite and refuge while they wait for their opportunity to request asylum in the United States. And, and so again, people have left their homes desperate because of violence or fear of violence and, and journey to the uh, southern border hoping to find an opportunity for safety and security in the long term. In the midst of all that, they've suffered a lot and, and they need help. And so what was a blessing was to see how people in Mexico, organizations in Mexico have come together to care for people. We saw compassionate people like Lika, one of the founders of the Casa de Misericordia y de todos las naciones, which is really the house of mercy for, for all the nations. An amazing shelter full of peace and love and hope in the midst of so much suffering and uncertainty. Lika is an administrator, but also more like a mother or grandmother to all the families. And she's a very talented artist creating an atmosphere of tranquility in a situation full of chaos and uncertainty. Lika and her shelter offer a place for people to find life and love in the midst of so much death or, or despair that feels like death. And so these are some pictures of some of the murals that she's done around the compound that create this atmosphere of peace and hope and love recognizing that God is with each person on their journey, both physically and spiritually. And Lika, I would call her Saint Lika because of just this um, personality that exudes calmness and peace and love. And, and she's created that atmosphere for her whole community in the shelter. What a blessing that she is. But these people, these migrants, both individuals and families of migrants, they are bound, they are stuck, they are tied up in knots by the violence, by the threats that they faced back home. And yet, here they are stuck in limbo, bound by the tomb of outdated laws and policies and under-resourced and rigid federal bureaucracies that simply can't provide the services or the permission that they need in order to move forward. 
They need a liberator. And I could talk for hours about some of the policies and procedures and things that just are, are not working and that we need to advocate for better ways of doing things. And we'll hopefully have an opportunity in the coming weeks to offer a day of, of sort of a mission report where I can give more details about that. But as we think about people stuck, in a sense, at our borders, we also want to stop and reflect on our own lives and recognize that there are things that bind us. And so I might ask you today, what are the things that bind you, that hold you, that hold you back, whether that's physically or spiritually or emotionally? Maybe, maybe you're stuck physically. You're, you're bound by a difficult health issue or a serious diagnosis. Maybe you're bound by emotional struggles or certain bad habits that have snared you and seem to be clinging on to you. Or maybe, like me, it's always having to live up to the expectations of others, or at least to think we do. Maybe it's your own perfectionism that restricts your ability to feel and be free. For some, like in our gospel lesson, maybe it's restrictive religious dogma or religious practices or tradition that makes you feel stuck in a tomb bound by funeral clothes. All of us, in one way or another, if we look in the mirror, if we assess ourselves honestly, are stuck or bound by things. And when we are held down by these things that bind us, we need a liberator, somebody to set us free. And that's why our gospel lesson offers us so much hope today. When Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead, Jesus literally liberates Lazarus from the grave and from his grave clothes. Nowhere is the choking reality of death on better display than here in what Jesus encounters once he finally arrives in Bethany. You could hear the sound of crying a long ways off, the whooping cries of the professional mourners mixed with the heaving sobs of Mary and Martha as they mourn the death of Lazarus. In the story, Jesus, as he's heading to Bethany, encounters Ma Martha first, perhaps recalling a time when Jesus chided her for staying in the kitchen too much. Martha is the first one to leave the house to seek out Jesus. Of course, it's difficult to know exactly just how she meets him, but I can sort of envision that she goes out to meet him with some measure of happy, unhappy disdain in her voice. Of course, all of us may have, in our deep grief, seen that grief turn to anger, haven't we? But I imagine Martha saying to Jesus, well, there you are. It's about time. This whole thing could have been avoided had you just shown up on time when we first called you. I know you could have healed Lazarus, same as you've done for lots of people, lots of people who mean a whole lot less to you than he did. I can imagine her responding that way. But Jesus simply responds and says, your brother will rise again. Well, Lord, if I had wanted a Hallmark card, of course, of course he will rise again at the last day when the roll is called up yonder by and by. But I'm hurting this day, Lord. And that is when Jesus responds and says it. He fixes Martha with an unusually intense stare and makes a claim so bold it brooks no middle ground in terms of its being true or false. He says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, right now, today, Martha, I am the role that's called up yonder, and I am now. Do you believe this? Perhaps with trembling lips and a quivering chin, I can see Martha responding with tears leaking out from her eyes, and, and saying to Jesus, yes, yes, I do believe that because I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You are the future of the whole universe that has come down into this world. Now, it was a bold thing for Jesus to say and a bolder thing really for Martha to buy into. But even so, within minutes, when Jesus then encounters Mary, who Martha sends to meet him, and then he encounters others who are mourning and deeply grieved, that's when Jesus loses it himself. He begins to weep. He weeps 
for the sorrow that he sees in others. He weeps for the sin that still continues to hold others bound down. But Jesus doesn't stop with the weeping. No, he then he acts. The scripture says, then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. And it was a cave and there was a stone lying against it. And Jesus says, take away the stone. Ooh, that might not be a good idea, Jesus. After four days of the body laying in the tomb there, Jesus, you don't want to do that. It's going to stink pretty bad. And Jesus says, just do it. Just do it so you can see God's glory. And then the impossible happens. Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man hears him and listens and comes out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus says to them, unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. What glorious words those must have been to Lazarus, but also to all those who were there. Unbind him and let him go. See, Lazarus was bound by the grave. He was bound by the cloths on his hand and his feet and his face. But Jesus, the liberator, sets him free by his, the power of his love. Now, that was an amazing spectacle, amazing accomplishment. Only a few others in Scripture have done this. And and so there is something radical happening here. But it's radical enough that it creates a lot of fear. A fear big enough that it creates literally a conspiracy to kill Jesus. A conspiracy that unfolds in the coming week. I mean, what could be considered a miracle, what should be considered a miracle worth rejoicing over, instead is perceived as a threat by the powers that be. Is it possible that Jesus, when Jesus enacted this miracle, bringing Lazarus back from the dead, he undermined the religious authority of the priests, like the high priest Caiaphas? And that reminds us, friends, of the danger that sometimes we face as religious people. You see, doctrine or the teaching of the church can be a means of grace, an access point to God's love for us. That's what it's meant to be. But when doctrine changes from a means of grace, granting us glimpses of God's mystery and mercy, when that changes into a religious paradigm that demands obedience, that must be enforced so that we can feel safe from the other, then that doesn't leave anyone liberated. You see, the high priests in their conspiracy reflexively went into enforcement mode after witnessing Jesus' liberating miracle. But enforcement mode is sort of the exact opposite of love. Now, it might be easy to look down on the religious leaders for their blindness to laws and traditions that had become stifling. But then again, if we're honest, we have to look in the mirror and ask, are we holding on to similar beliefs or practices that keep people bound in grave clothes rather than setting them free to truly live and experience real life? Jesus came to be the liberator, not the binder. He is the one who sets us free from the things the beliefs, the bad habits, the expectations, the sins that bind us. And he sets us free through the power of his love and mercy, his boundless and never-ending love. And so we can rejoice with the psalmist who, we, as we heard in Psalm 130, says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is great power to redeem. And Jesus, who himself just moments before had said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And that's when he says, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. And Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. So we praise God for that power of, of freedom that lets us be free from the sins that entangle us. Now we understand from the psalmist that 
All of us fall short of God's glory. The psalmist in Psalm 130 knows all about God's mercy and compassion. As as the psalmist points out, if you, O God, should mark iniquities, who could stand? You know, the psalmist is raising this important question for us and, and saying, you know, the obvious is, who could stand? None of us, if God measures us. If, if God were to hold against us an account of all the wrongs that we've done or to use that to weigh our worth, what hope would we have? And the answer is just as obvious. No one could stand. No one would have a hope. But that's fortunately not where the psalmist ends up. It goes on to say, but, but the psalmist says, there is forgiveness with you. What a beautiful, amazing possibility. What a ground of hope and life. We are set free from the sin that binds us because of the forgiveness that God offers to us. So when we think about all these things, when we think about the things that bind us and hold us down, we put this all together and we recognize that sometimes the things that we think offer love actually are things that tie us down or bind us, preventing us from being full and whole and offering our very best love to the world. Again, this story of Lazarus so beautifully illustrates where where these funeral shrouds, these wrappings of cloth, trail him out of the tomb. They offer us this amazing metaphor of new life as we recognize that true love is that which unbinds us and gives us more freedom, not less. So today, what is it that is binding you? Jesus is standing outside your tomb and saying, come out, walk, live, love. Shed your funeral clothes and offer your deepest self, your deepest love to the world and for the world. May you be open to God's freeing love today so that whatever it is that's holding you back, you will know God's liberation, God's life and love in you so that then you too can become an agent helping to set others free from what binds them. Amen and amen. We turn now to the prayers of the people and let us prepare our hearts as we continue to follow this ancient tradition of celebrating with the joy of Christ and God as we pray, God have mercy on us. And the word for that is kieri eleison, which means God have mercy on us. And so after each section of prayer, we invite you to respond with this word of, of um, ex- expectation and appeal. Kieri eleison, kieri eleison, kieri eleison. God have mercy on us. So first, we begin our time of prayer with prayers for the world. Let us pray. Loving Creator, we come to you asking for strength to work for the liberation of our world. So much binds bodies, lives, and hearts, keeping so many from freedom and full life. Death comes in many forms, choking out, flourishing. We grieve what seems at times like the death of hope. Show us how to love in liberating ways that create more freedom and hope. And so we pray this day, remembering again those suffering in Ukraine and the war. We pray for residents of Mississippi affected by the recent tornado outbreaks this weekend and the other things that are on your heart or your mind as we pray for the world around us. Take a moment of silent prayer. And so we say, God, have mercy. In this chanting, we lift up to the world to you with our love as we say together, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison. And then prayers for our community. Loving Sovereign, we come to you asking for strength to work for the liberation of our communities, of our church. Show us how to love in unfettered ways that create celebrations of life lived fully. Show us how to love in ways that heal and comfort. We pray this day for Beth, who rejoices in the opportunity to get a seeing eye dog. We pray for the family of 
Marilyn Thompson, who passed away yesterday. And we pray for Cynthia Terwilliger, who is expected to have double knee replacement surgery on April 5th. And then we take a moment of silent prayer to lift up whatever is on your heart for neighbors, for friends, for people in our community that we care about. Take a moment. God, have mercy. In this chanting, we lift up this community to you with our love as we together say, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison. And then prayers for our relationships. Loving parent, we come to you asking for strength to work for the liberation of our relationships. We profess to want liberation for all, and yet too often we are part of the constriction of love. Show us how to love in ways that strengthen our bonds while also unbinding others from our own limited perspectives, our own fear. We pause in silence as we lift up in our hearts the relationships that need your love. Take a moment to pray for relationships. God, have mercy. In this chanting, we lift each other up to you with our love as we say together, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison, Kieri eleison. And then prayers for ourselves. Lover of our souls, we come to you asking for strength to work for our own liberation. We create tombs of our own as we cling to all that cannot give us life. Help us to shed the burial clothes of past mistakes and regrets. Help us to know the lure of your love for us so that we may, be for your, we may be your love in this world, in our communities, and in the lives with whom we intersect each day. God, have mercy. In this chanting, we open ourselves to your love. Kieri eleison, kieri eleison, kieri eleison. And so, as your people following in the ways of your son, Jesus, who set the pattern of love, as liberation from death, we now pray with confidence the prayer that he taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We are so thankful for God's liberating love that sets us free from the sin that so easily entangles us. And our response is one of gratitude and thanksgiving and, and generosity. So on this Sunday, the last Sunday of March, we celebrate and continue to celebrate all the ministries and missions of our church, especially our missions team, which provides so many opportunities for, for us to put our love into action for our neighbors, for the people around us. And so we celebrate our monthly real meal, which is tonight, and, and, and we have an opportunity to bless our neighbors with food. And we bless children around the community with our Summer Lunch and More program starting this summer. And so many other missions, our recent virtual mission trip to uh, cent uh, Central Mexico, Puebla, Mexico, with Give Ye Them to Eat, and the plans to make an in-person visit and mission trip next year in March. And for the trip I just had, the opportunity to go and visit the border of Arizona and Mexico to see firsthand what's going on and the life and the community that exists there. And so for all these good gifts and the, all these opportunities to put our faith into action, we want to say thank you to being partners for helping make this happen with your generous gifts and your time and your talents. If you'd like to offer a gift this week, we invite you to go to our webpage, which is firstumc.net. Scroll down to the red e-giving button and you can give to all sorts of different missions and ministries. Or you can simply mail a gift here to the church at 317 North 4th Street. But regardless of how you choose to participate, how you choose to give, all we can say is thank you, thank you, thank you for your generous gifts and for your partnership. 
May God bless and keep you, and we give thanks again for all that you do. Amen. Join me now in the benediction as we read responsively. Go forth into the world looking for love in all the right places. And we respond together. We will look for signs of the liberator shedding the shrouds of death to live and love fully. Amen. May you do that. May you and I do that together. Now before we take off, here's some ways that you can be nurturing love, putting your faith into action. First of all, as we mentioned during the prayer time or during the offering time, this is Real Meal Sunday. So later today from 5.30 to 6.30, we will be offering a free community meal. You are all welcome to come and join us. You can come in person and eat around a table with others in our fellowship hall, or you can drive through the alley and pick up a meal to take home and, and enjoy. But this is also an opportunity to be a blessing to a friend or neighbor or somebody who you think might need a, a good meal for the evening. And so feel free to come by and pick up a meal for your next door neighbor or another friend who could use a meal and drop it off for them. Or even better yet, pick them up and bring them here to the church and eat at the table so that they can be introduced to others in our congregation. But tonight, 5.30 to 6.30, real meal. If you'd like to help serving, uh, there's preparation time starting at 3 or you can show up at 5 o'clock to be one of the servers or one of those running meals out to those picking up in the alley. So join us for the real meal today. We also continue our mission collecting funds for more than a bandage for Give You Them to Eat down in Puebla, Mexico. We're, we're gathering funds through uh, next weekend and so if you'd like to participate in that, we thank you for your gifts in that. And finally, here's a mark your calendar item. We are we are going to be moving. Our church is picking up and literally moving to a new location over the summer. But we recognize that this space that we've worshipped in since 1908 has so many memories, so many important sacred moments in people's lives that we want to honor and celebrate that legacy and remember together. So on Sunday, May 7th, the first Sunday of May, we're going to sponsor a homecoming celebration where anybody who's been part of the church through the years is invited back to come and celebrate this space. We'll have worship at 9 o'clock, a special fellowship hour with 
uh, refreshments and a silent auction, and then just an open house throughout the building so people can remember and celebrate. And you can take pictures and, and talk to people that you may have enjoyed spending time with years ago. Uh, so join us, mark your calendars for Sunday, May 7th, and think about who might want to know or be invited. So reach out to friends or family members who have formerly been part of the church and say, hey, come back to celebrate this space before we move to the new building, Sunday, May 7th. Well, friends, that's all we have in terms of our faith in action component today. Thank you so much for worshiping with us at home or wherever you are. We invite you to, again, come back next Sunday, April 2nd, as we celebrate Palm Passion Sunday, the start of Holy Week, and the journey toward the cross, and then, of course, Easter resurrection. So next Sunday, we continue our series, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. And, and again, we invite you to join us at 9 a.m. In the meantime, I invite you to have a great week. Celebrate God's love in you fully and be witnesses of that love to those around you. Go in peace and go in grace. Good morning. 20 years ago, a committee was formed to study both the physical and the economic efficiency of our current building. Following that evaluation, the decision was made and a vision was created to buy land, build a new church, sell our current church, all without taking on a mortgage. Today, we stand at the threshold of making this vision a reality. We have actually begun making plans to move into our new church in the upcoming months, and yes, without a mortgage. I'm Jim Horn, along with Tom Weber. We have been the co-chairs of the last two building campaigns, the first one being a three-year campaign from the fall of 2018 through 2021. The second campaign was a one-year campaign during the 2022 year. The 2022 Help Build the Future campaign ended December 31st of 2022 this past year. Comments, commitments to the campaign totaled well over $1.4 million. This represents another major step in meeting our ongoing goal of not taking out a mortgage to build our new church. The 2022 campaign do donations actually totaled $1,545,000 in both pledged and non-pledged giving. This combined with our previous three-year campaign and other donations helped us raise nearly $5 million to buy land and build a new church. What a generous and sharing congregation we have here at First United Methodist Church. And now here's Tom. Thank you, Jim. As campaign co-chairs for both campaigns, we want to thank everyone who both donated to and worked on the two campaigns. It is simply impossible to thank every individual without missing someone. Between the two campaigns, over 60 volunteers served on teams, but we won't, do want to extend our sincere thanks to the chairs and team members for their dedication and hours of work. To everyone who donated to the campaign to reach our goal of not having a mortgage. To Greg McGarvey of Horizon Stewardship for his spiritual-based guidance throughout both campaigns. To the FUMC Foundation Board of Directors for their generous donation. To Pastor Jonathan for his support and guidance throughout. And especially to all who prayed and asked, Lord, what do you want to do through me? We also want to thank the members who joined us on the campaign executive teams. During the 2018 three-year campaign, the other executive team members were Herb Buer, Sally Mullis, Robert Walters, and Pastor Paul Judd, followed by Pastor Jonathan Crail. During the 2022 one-year campaign, those who joined us on the executive team were Rhonda Wyburn, Robert Walters, Gina Wisdom, and Pastor Jonathan. Thank you to all these people and to each and every member of our church family, and especially to God for providing us all with inspiration and guidance. Thank you. <laughs>